If anybody's willing to move, they'd like you to come forward. Come on. Hello? <laughs> Is it on? Okay, Pat, how do you turn it on? It's not on. Okay. Well, I will attack the microphone here. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, this evening at 8 o'clock, Lawrence Jones will be lecturing in the sunroom on the Ezekiel experience. And uh, tomorrow at noon, in the same place as we are today, they are, uh, we are, we'll have Stephanie Kuntz, and she will be speaking on families in the American dream. Um, our speakers today will be Francis Morlepe and Paul Dubois, and together they are the co-founders of the Institute for the Arts of Democracy. And Ms. Le Pay is the author of several books, including Diet for a Small Planet and Rediscovering America's Values, which are both available for sale at the table next to the door. Um, she has also co-founded the Institute for Food and Development Policy. Uh, Mr. Dubois has been vice president at Cambridge College and at the College of the Atlantic. He also has authored books such as The Hospice Way of Death and Modern Practices in Human Service Agencies. Together they have authored a new book, Doing Democracy, which will be out later this year. We hope you will join us for the rest of this week's activity, and we would like to remind you that Tuesday's presentation does begin at 7 p.m. and not 8 p.m. as stated in our brochure. And please give a warm welcome to Francis Morlepay and Paul Dubois. Okay, do you want to move this forward? Should we do this? If you won't come to us, we'll All right. come yeah, to no. you. All right, how's that? Okay, great. Um, just to start, we know that a number of you have to leave at 1 o'clock. That's fine. Our feelings are not going to be crushed or whatever. Um, if you leave, however, at 12.59, that's a very different story. Um, um, how many of you were at last night's presentation? Aha. Uh -huh. oh. huh? People basically on the fringes. <laughs> <Are> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, we really only have, I mean, we have considerably less than an hour, I guess. That's not very much time to talk, talk with you. And we, we'd like to get a sense of how you'd like to spend this time together. We really have several options. I mean, one is that we could spend perhaps as long as, say, 30 minutes telling you, um, perhaps in slightly different words, but pretty much what we had to say last night. Let's just call that option one for a minute, okay? And we can kind of recapitulate what we did last night, and then you can... And, and, and then we can have a, have a very short general discussion. Another is that we could spend about 10 minutes doing that, um, just trying to really synopsize, and then you can, um, and then we can have, open it up to general discussion for everybody. And the third option that, that we thought of is that we could divide into, into small groups after a very short synopsis, and we could begin to discuss some of the issues, particularly around power in our own lives, that, um, that we touched upon last night. In other words, we could, in 10 minutes, tell you what we had to say in whatever it is, an hour last night, and then, um, and then we could have some small group discussions, and then maybe we could talk a little bit more generally at the end of that, OK? Um, so the first option is that we just talk to you for a half hour or so, and then have a general discussion. How many would rather have us do that? Anybody? OK. All right, that's a whole bunch. Okay, the mainline people, not the fringes. <laughs> All right, and then how many would rather have us say talk for ten minutes, maybe fifteen at the most, and then have a general discussion with, among everybody? Okay, that's close to half and half. But we're getting. What do you say? And how many wanted? How many would like to have some small group discussions and, and that sort of thing? Okay. All right. Okay, that, that's even fewer. What do you want to do? I'd what, like what to see the hands again for option one. Oh, come on. Okay. Okay. What do you oh, want to do? I think they're more for option one. You think they're more for option one? You do. Gosh, <laughs> I hate to, I don't hate to dis you think there are? Yeah, some of you are nodding. I hate to disappoint the fringe element, but <laughs> um, it looks like there are a lot more people who just, Joe, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll never lose this down. I know. <laughs> Looks like there are a lot more people who just want us to talk a little bit. Um, so why don't we do that and then we'll have a general discussion, okay? I guess. Um, all right. Okay. We'll do that. Let's, let's start with, with just a, a, a 
pitch is a very short personal statement from each of us about why we came to this work, so just so you know something about us, and then, and then we can get, okay. get on to the heart of the, of the talk last night. Okay. Well, as Jennifer introduced me, you heard that my first um, sort of public statement as a person in my mid-twenties was a book called Diet for a Small Planet. It started out actually as a one-page handout, and I thought I should know a little bit more about it, and it became Diet for a Small Planet, sort of. I don't exactly know how that happened, but once it was out there, I, I sort of became the Julia Childs of the soybean circuit during the 1970s. And um, it was very different than what I wanted to do when I, when I wrote that one-page handout, because what I really wanted to do was to explain to people that hunger is needless. It is made by human beings. Not, no, we can't blame nature. And I thought if I could just expose people to the reality of obviously needless hunger and help to, s to show how um, concentrated forms of decision making, whether we're talking about economic or political, from the village level to the level of international trade, how fewer and fewer people making the decisions was actually cutting people out of the capacity to feed themselves. And that was really what, what hunger was all about. So, I, I tried harder and harder into the 80s as I wrote other books on the institute I, I helped to found Food First. Um, I finally sort of boiled my, my message down to one simple theme, and that is that hunger is not caused by a scarcity of food or scarcity of land. It's actually caused by a scarcity of democracy. But as the 80s progressed and I got more and more emphatic with that message, I got more and more uncomfortable in standing in front of audiences because people would say, okay, uh, if, if <coughs> hunger is caused by a scarcity of democracy, where is that democracy you talk about that's going to end hunger? What do you really mean by a democracy that's able to end hunger? I don't see it, and, and how is it possible? And so in that, out of that discomfort, I kept pushing myself out of that discomfort, I kept pushing myself harder and harder to try to figure out, well, how do we talk about uh, the next stage in the evolution of democracy without presenting some model, some idealized model that, that it's going to disempower people even more because they know we can't achieve that ideal. And out of that discomfort, tremendous discomfort, gradually came the themes that we're going to be talking about today, what we talk about when we say living democracy. And what I really came to was that democracy has to be seen not as an endpoint that we arrive at, not as a model that we ultimately achieve, but a process that we engage in every day of our lives. And that we have an historic moment now, I believe, um, and for many, many reasons I think that's true, to begin to redefine democracy in the ways that we're going to be talking about today, so that in fact it will be vital enough to to end hunger and address the other profound social and environmental problems that face us. So that's something of how I got here in a couple of minutes uh, rendition. And Paul has his right. very different version. Right. Well, when I was the age of most of the people here, um, it was the 1960s and I guess the 1970s, and I was very, very much involved in the civil rights movement um, and very, very active. I went to jail a total of 42 times on civil rights marches <laughs> that might suggest a level of failure rather than a level of success. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, and, and I, was, I was really seething with anger about the oppression of, of my people, about problems of racism and poverty. And so I knew then that I really wanted to spend the rest of my life doing something about this. And it, and it was my people, black people, who, who especially, um, um, it was, um, was, was, was most especially in, important to me. And, and I became very unhappy with the civil rights era. We could talk about that if you wanted to at some point. Because the gains seemed to me to be well-defined at first and very limited. And then the major backlash that occurred seemed to me to, to present a barrier that meant that we were going to go nowhere in this kind of tactic. I then became um, um, the executive director of a large black community organization, the largest in New York State. Um, and we ran programs in which people had a good deal of decision-making power, and I tried to learn some lessons from that, that people who the society normally thinks of as not capable of making very good decisions were, in fact, quite capable, <laughs> quite capable, 
with enough knowledge and, the, and enough <laughs> skills to, to, to run programs that did them a great deal of good. Um, I then tried college teaching for a while, um, um, partially to regroup and, 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 and to kind of recover from burnout and, uh, um, um, and, 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 and to try a, a, very, a very different approach of basically teaching the young. And I learned from that experience and from a variety of other experiences with Planned Parenthood and some professional associations and, and the, uh, the human potential movement and so on, a number of lessons which seemed to me to come together. And the way they came together was really fundamentally this, that the problems that I have been most concerned about for my life, that many of you are concerned about, in many, many ways seem to me to not be getting a great deal better. That the problems of racism, environmental degradation, poverty, homelessness, and so on, we all know that. And we know that although there have been, for example, among black people, um, a very large proportion of black people from the gains of the 1960s who have entered the middle class, um, they've also fled to the suburbs and that the people who have left behind is Kathleen Cleaver, the, the wife of, of Eldridge Cleaver, um, one of the leaders of the Black Panthers back in the 70s said very recently, things have never been worse in her lifetime. Well, I, that's, that's true for all of us, that for those who have left behind, in fact, things have not been, have, have, never, have never really um, been worse than, than they are today. So what is it? What is it that, that explains what seems to be to be widespread failure? And as in Francis's terms, it seems to me that, that one, what one has to do is to go deeper. And when you begin to go deeper, you begin to understand that there's something wrong with the way, in fact, we function as a society. Or to put it another way, there's something wrong with the way we practice democracy, that democracy, the promise of democracy has never come close to being realized here. And that's, that's where we begin this, this talk, and that's where we begin this life's work, that underneath it, that we don't care what you do with the problems that you're most concerned about, homelessness, environment, anything else. What we would argue is that until, in fact, millions more people learn to be engaged in democratic decision making and learn to lend their creativity to problem solving and learn to have their values expressed in public policy, that in fact these problems are not really going to get substantially better, no matter how many millions of people continue to work on them. I think in closing there, Paul, you really laid out the challenge uh, that, is the, that has arisen through each of our life experience. And so I, all I can do is really try to put it out there in the simplest terms, and that is that we are saying that no matter what special interest you have, uh, whether it be the environment, whether it be uh, issues of, of gender, whether it be poverty, whether it be the AIDS crisis, whether whatever your concern, that none of these can be addressed successfully unless we are going deeper to the underlying question of how. How do we reinvent a, a, a process, a democratic process, whether it be in our classroom, in our universities, in our communities, in which we, those of us who have to live with the decisions, have a role in making the decisions. And this requires really something quite radical, a profound rethinking of democracy itself and redefining what we mean by public life. It's not just what, what uh, celebrities have, it's not just what public officials have, it's what every one of us here has every day. We walk outside of our homes, our intimate relationships, and we sit in a classroom or we stand before a classroom, we go into the workplace, we relate to the media or human services. In each of those roles, we are shaping the communities in which we participate. We are making choices even by choosing not to react, even by choosing to be passive. We are creating the public life in which we all uh, are shaped. So uh, that really then um, begins to suggest uh, a number of themes that we have to rethink. And we begin with rethinking what is self-interest, because that's uh, a very important element of uh, democracy that is not just simply a set of government structures, but it becomes a way of life. You know, when we ask people, as we did last night, what you think of when you think of self-interest, what comes to mind. The first word that we usually get 
is selfishness. Um, we also get the sense from many, many people that it's something to be overcome, that we all ought to learn to be of service, that we ought to somehow, and we, we hear this on Sunday mornings from pulpits all across the country, that we ought to somehow learn to set aside our self-interest and act on behalf of the common good. And yet, what, what the successful organizations and people across this country whom we have been studying have been teaching us about self-interest is that it really doesn't have to be a dirty word and that if you try to set it aside, that in fact you're not going to wind up being very successful. If you'll turn to handout number three at the bottom of that page, you'll see a chart that says rethinking self-interest. <coughs> Okay, and you'll see three orientations to self-interest. One is service, the second is selfishness, and the third is relational self-interest. And what we've been learning from organizations like the Industrial Areas Foundation and quite a number of others which have effectively managed to change the quality of life in a variety of, of poor communities across this country and, and middle class communities also, um, is that relational self-interest says to you, you know, there's really nothing wrong with acknowledging that in fact you have some important interests that have to be taken into account when you become active in your public life. And your public life, as Francis was, was pointing out, really includes everything. How you, how you behave in school, what happens in your workplace, what happens at the human service agency or the hospital or the clinic that you visit, and so on, right down the line, what happens in your neighborhood, where you live, what kind of housing you have, and all the rest of it, um, and, and, and how you deal with banking and, and, and so many other important institutions, everything outside of your immediate small family. Um, you have interest in all of this, and it is perfectly appropriate for you to learn to express those interests and to learn to tie those interests, to connect those interests to the interest of other people. And it is this relational self-interest, it is this connected interest, mine with yours, that enables us once through enough discussion, through enough understanding your, of my interest, mine of your interest, to, to act effectively and act in unison. And it's a very, very different message, this business of self-interest, than what we usually hear which, as I said, is usually, you know, it's got to be dog-eat-dog dog and get what I want, or it ought to, you know, we ought to play Mother Teresa. Now, what do we do in order to um, learn how to relate our interests back and forth and to develop a sense of the larger and relational interest? Well, we've got a lot of skills that we've got to learn. And, it's, and skills relate it not only to self-interest, but also to power and quite a variety of other things that we've got to learn in order to be effective citizens in this society. If you'll turn that page over to handout number four, no, I'm sorry, excuse me. If you'll turn it to handout number five, where we talk about the arts of democratic life, you'll see that we've listed there, um, nine I guess it says, okay, of the kinds of skills that we really don't practice very much. And it's interesting, isn't it, that you can get all the way through even a college education at a good university. And in fact, I think if you were to grade yourself on how good a listener you are, how good you are at dealing with conflict, dealing with anger, negotiating interest, mediation, envisioning a future, for your society, for your neighborhood, for your organization, for yourself, at engaging in dialogue or coming together with others at public judgment or evaluating and reflecting what really happens within your own activities, that in fact you'd have to admit, as most Americans do, that we have almost no experience at any of that. Isn't that true? Isn't that effectively true? I mean, wouldn't you really have to give us all pretty low grades? at all of these kinds of skills, and yet this is precisely what is necessary in order to have an effective democracy, a democracy that works to solve our problems. It's, I think it's an eye-opener to realize that we can, get, that we can be well-educated people with great futures for the most part, effective in this society, we think, 
and yet not be able to function effectively in public life to solve the problems that, that are on the hearts and minds of so many of us. Why don't we stop talking about the arts and move to power for just a few minutes? Well, both of these, both of these themes that Paul has outlined of, of self-interest and these, the missing arts, <laughs> the, in, the arts that really don't get visibility in the society, don't get the emphasis that we're saying they would if we took democratic practice and democratic problem solving seriously. All those really are ways of expressing power. So to understand what we mean by a democracy vital enough to actually solve our public problems, we have to rethink power. And just like Paul said with self-interest, we get bombarded with, with messages that, that actually paralyze us, messages like, you know, squelch your self-interest. Well, vis-a-vis -vis power, we also get very negative messages. We, last night, we asked the audience, what is the first thing you think of when you hear the word power? We got words like manipulation, coercion, uh, money, men, Paul added white men. Um, a lot of negative, we got one positive at the very end, love. But generally speaking, we think of power as dirty because it's corrupting. It has to be, by necessity, manipulative. Uh, and I think that we think of power as, as kind of a commodity, an entity, that either you got it or you don't. And if Paul has it, I don't, and vice versa. I mean, it's, it's, it's either or. And we think that both of these notions, that power is dirty, is corrupted, and that it's, it's an either or, both of these are very disempowering and, in fact, inaccurate. Because if we look more deeply into our own lives and without this sort of messages coloring our, our, our experience, what our teachers, and again, I want to underline that everything that we're saying today is a condensation of the lessons that we are being taught by quote unquote ordinary people all around the country. Our research today is not going into the UN documents like I used to to write books about world hunger. It is sitting in people's living rooms, in, in, in their halls, in their churches, in their synagogues, listening to what is working for them. How are they discovering power? And that's what we're talking about this morning, what we are learning from, from them, not what we have just uh, invented out of our own heads. So back to power. So what people are discovering is that what works is thinking about power always as a relationship. If we all are indeed are, are these social beings embedded in relationships, then power is always operating in relationships. And so that what I do, even if, I, if it's just to sit passively in a classroom, it affects what goes on in front of that classroom because there is a relationship there. There is a response to sitting passively in a classroom. A professor then in front of that classroom responds to that passivity. We could give you, a, 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 you know, thousands of examples, but the point is that our behavior, because we are these social creatures, affects each other so that power is always in operating in a relationship. And once you realize that and start to think of it that way, then you realize that you have to get out of the simple blaming mode it's his fault, it's her fault, it's the boss's fault, it's the professor's fault, it's the administration's fault, it's the president's fault. And see that in some way there is some opportunity for you to affect that relationship. There are some openings for power that maybe you didn't think that you had. And then what, what it happens with the citizens that we've been talking with is they start to discover sources of power that never had occurred to them before. They started discovering, say, for example, the kind of power that knowledge gives them, that they can dig out the information they want to know. Paul gave an example last night of low-income citizens who dug out the information about financing for housing, particularly in the, in their, in, in the inner city, and how banks were taking money out of the inner city and what could be done. They ended up learning more, as one professor told us, than, than most finance professors know about such things and ended up pushing through national legislation that brought $8 billion uh, in bank uh, investment back into the inner city. The power of knowledge is, is discovered, the power of humor, the, and throwing, your, throwing people off guard by being able to, to, to turn a situation into a humorous one, and we gave examples last night. So on, um, on handout, we've included on handout number three on the top of the page, We've covered my first points here about power, the contrast between 
power as, as something that is dirty and always manipulative to something that is in fact uh, mutually expanding and that exists in a relationship and that therefore can be freeing when it is collaborative. And on the back side of that same page, we've included just a few of the examples of what happens when people break out of the old notion of power and walk into the notion of power as a relationship <coughs> in which they have some they perhaps now invisible sources to cultivate and that, that once they focus on those, then um, that sense of powerlessness, which is one of the easiest ways to, to, you know, to, feel, to feel cynical, cynical as a simple cop-out, <coughs> as a simple, uh, there's nothing I can do because I have no power, so therefore you can't blame me for not doing anything. Well, once you rethink power in this way, there, there are no more easy outs. And we begin to see that no matter how much p less power we may have in any given situation, we are never totally powerless. So um, that's the, some of the general orientation about some of the themes that we're learning about those who are beginning to turn our democracy from a s formal static institution or process to a living process that we can all be engaged in. So I like that last phrase, we can all be engaged in. Um, let's think about questions that you have and how we can all get engaged here in a discussion of this really rather strange kind of notion, isn't it? I mean, in most, I've been a professor of, of uh, public policy and political science and public administration, and it's interesting that in all of those courses and all the courses that I had to take in order to get my doctorate and all this sort of thing, that um, you hardly ever hear anything about democracy. This is a very, very new subject and it's a, for, 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 for most people. So we'd love to get your questions, but we'd also like to kind of get you engaged, if we can, in a, in a conversation about you know, what you think about some of these notions. Let me just tell you that the kinds of lessons that we've been drawing, as we tried to explain last night, are from quite a wide variety of um, institutions and success stories that we've been very privileged to go around the country and discover. People have been very, very successful. Poor people, middle class people, wealthy people coming together, black people, white people in quite a variety of settings about the schools within classrooms and entire school districts, including the entire city of Chicago, learning to have parents and teachers and students come together to make many more decisions about the schools um, than, than is, is, is the usual case. And within classrooms, professors and teachers, high school teachers, elementary school teachers, learning to involve students in, um, in, in the educational process and in making decisions about what it is they're going to learn and how they're going to go about learning it. So therefore, what they feel is a sense of ownership of the process. They learn more, they stay in school longer, they do better. Um, the same with regard to economics. And, you know, Francis just mentioned the, the, the case of, of low-income people really effectively changing the way large banks in this country do business vis-a-vis -vis the inner city. Um, we have examples in the media, examples in human services, examples in local governments. Um, some of those are very, very briefly summarized in the first handout um, that you've got on that first page. Just a few true stories, I mean, a few, uh, you know, that will give you just a sense. And in order to do the book that we've got coming out later this year, we, um, you know, we're very, really very, very lucky. We've been allowed to basically travel around the country, find these stories, and let, ask these people, what are the lessons that you've learned over years of struggle? to produce these kinds of successes. So, why don't we open it up? Great, why, um, I'll tell you what, we'll just, why don't we just start and we'll go around this way, okay? Let's we'll start with you and then we'll go back back down. The first mm -hmm. comment and question deals, I think maybe you've answered it, and that is that what I'd like to see are names and addresses and manuals of how to do it. Now, presumably uh -huh. this is in your book coming out. Names and addresses are how to do it, are, of how to do it are, are in the book. Um, we are assembling these resource guides you know, the interesting thing is it's sort of how to do it. That's part of our institute's mission because there's so little throughout this, throughout this entire democracy of a quarter of a billion people about how to do democracy. 
oh, by the way, the title of the book is Doing Democracy. <laughs> but in any case, um, why, don't, why, don't you, why, don't, why don't you explain just a little bit about the Institute and the sorts of things we're trying to do? Well, let, let me say, just to re-emphasize what Paul just said, that, that those of you who, who begin to feel any of the passion that we do about, about this, this very, very important uh, approach to problem solving, to really let, think of it in this way, uh, what it requires on all of our parts is, is, yes, looking to see what other people have done, but also realizing that we ourselves have to be the inventors because we are charting new waters. We, 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 this is not something, while there are um, m many examples that we use in our book, our last chapter is, 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 um, is the how-to chapter, and it includes stories from people across the country and a, a resource guide of training programs, but they're just a handful around the country. We have to all be inventing them with the, in our own universities and our own organizations. We have to be creating programs. One of the things that the groups do, for example, that we have um, uh, been most educated by ourselves is, and you can do this in your own classrooms, in your own clubs, in your own churches and synagogues, is begin simply um, by being conscious of after every major event or every, every meeting to really do an in-depth evaluation. <coughs> what worked here and what didn't in terms of the participatory arts that we're, we're trying to, to further how did we deal with conflict? Begin to do that sort of review. How can we ourselves, just through reflection, uh, do better in terms of integrating diverse views, create an environment which is open to, to conflict and dissent? <coughs> so there's a beginning practice that we can all engage in um, wherever we are, at whatever level we are, simply by being, beginning to be reflective. But again, as Paul mentioned, we do have a resource guide that we can send you that mentions some of these training organizations, and the last chapter of our new book will be the, the how-to's chapter. But we all have to be inventors, so I'm just saying we can't look to any other sort of institute to do it. We all have to be part of this invention. Okay. Gary, I guess you were next. Or? Can we get a couple of students to respond to that? I mean, he's talking about you, right? Well, uh, what professors do you think? too. And professors too, obviously. What do you think? Wait. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think, you know, a large part of the problem is the prevailing concept of democracy in our society as presented to us by the intellectual culture. You know, the universities, the mass media. We are, the, you know, we are really taught that there's a necessary connection between what they really mean when they say democracy is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're talking about a democracy is opening up in Eastern Europe, there's a democracy in Honduras, in Venezuela, what they're really talking about is happening. And they confuse the two, they confuse the two terms, but mm -hmm. it really, in effect, you know, demobilizes us and really distorts our view of the world. I mean, I spent three weeks in Cuba over the summer and I've never been in a more democratic society. Yeah, we're told that's undemocratic because it's social. Now, why do you say it was a democratic society? Well, and then I want to ask you, I mean, are you, in, are you functioning in a democracy? But go ahead, why do you say that where you were this summer well, because, was a democracy? Because I witnessed things like, you know, an entire community getting together and deciding what kind of factory they wanted in their community, mm -hmm. whether they wanted a, a factory to produce a soda pop or canned goods. And it was actually the community making the decision. And, you know, people in the community mobilizing together, you know, because of the economic mm -hmm. problems, they're deciding who can use electricity on this day, and, you know, I mean, very serious things. But the political activity and organization is so strong, and people understanding the government, understanding what their government imports, what they export, I mean, it was, it was a real eye-opener for me, especially for somebody who's been taught that, you know, that society is undemocratic because there's, there's no elections, or, you know, and even though there's, there's 
a lot of elections and they have like 90 that turn out at their, at their elections, you know, but, but um, I mean, how, how do we offset the propaganda that we receive 24 hours a day? I mean, through the mass media, I mean, I'd like to say something. through the corporate owned media, I mean, short of, of <laughs> Well, I'd like to answer that by going back to what Gary said, because the only way I'm convinced, after, after years of trying to, to, to do it another way, is the only way that people begin to work through the myth that simple, simple capitalism is equals democracy, or simple free markets, is by doing. And I think of an example I used last night, for the view of you who were there, very briefly, uh, in Connecticut, an example of a broad-based citizen organization uh, that includes unions and churches and synagogues and other citizen groups. And what they have done is challenged the uh, corporations that want to just flee and leave people with no benefits. They've challenged them successfully, bought out their, the, in, in several cases, successfully bought these companies. They have set up a state trust fund to help <coughs> workers buy their firms. They have set up a community land trust to, to fight speculation on housing costs that keep people out of, uh, that make pe some people homeless. And so it's by the doing of democracy that these people in this community, we, I talked particularly about a 63-year-old woman who had never been involved really outside of her, her church before, and she's now very active in this organization. And it was through Teresa's experience of actually discovering by doing that she could be an economic decision maker, that she didn't have to simply be at the mercy of what the corporation's leaders decided or simply what the market would dictate and that she could be a player in making sure that the market and the corporate interests in the community also were responding to her needs. And so it was through doing it that she, could, she became, I'm sure, less vulnerable to the simple propaganda that the market is the be all and end all uh, of, 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 of freedom and, and democracy. So I think, again, it's back to the doing of it, the experiencing of it, that we, we, that we learn the lesson. I think somebody's sort of come around. I think there was somebody back here who was an academic come back up here, I guess. But yeah. I think I learned that we really, uh, what you're saying, we interpret. Can, can you all hear her? No, I know. OK, why don't you say that again and then explain it a little bit more. <laughs> you mean what we're talking about is just a tad radical? <laughs> okay, why? Why is this so very, very different? Well, it's, um, you're not having the institutions um, with the same role as the institutions. And uh, what the American people had before was No, I, I think you're onto something. Yeah, you, you think, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think the point there is that a re representative um, denotes that somebody higher than us, and that there is, a, there is another level above us that has a better idea of what's just good for us. And that was, in fact, the intention of the Italian fathers, is that the, you know, the, the, the whole of the population was not able to make decisions for themselves, especially the middle class. And that these white men would get together and do that for us. And it was benevolence, but it was also denying mm -hmm. us and, and still does harm us. Mm -hmm. um, if we let it, like you say, if we give them enough power, then they do some bad stuff. Yeah. It's always interesting to me that we can, in a very simple sense, that we can give up so much power to people who screw it up so badly. Yeah. <laughs> But it's in the very, one of the things that we've discovered in the very, <coughs> of the screwing up that, that has happened, that in itself has empowered so many people. I mean, we've talked to people in the Chicago school system who said, well, what makes you think you can do anything better? And we said, well, you couldn't do anything worse than they don't. <laughs> and, and so that's part of why we have a sense of hope now, because so many people are realizing that the quote unquote experts up there who were supposed to have done it, that the nature of today's problems, it, it just can't be solved. They can't be solved. You know, Jimmy Carter once said in an off-guard moment that the reason he ran for president was because he became governor and he visited the White House and he found out um, really almost the same lesson, that the person who was president 
um, was certainly not any smarter than he was. And you know, so on all the way along the line. We, we talk to people who say, you know, I have a sixth grade education. You know, that's as far as I got. And yet, in fact, I'm finding out a few things. I can do at least as good a job at public affairs when I learn the skills as the people who I've been selecting to do it. And the second thing I'm finding out is that it's fun, that it really changes my life for the better, and that, in fact, I grow, my spouse grows, and that, in fact, I'm having a great time, and now I wouldn't change it for, for, for a thing. Um, I, I remember talking to two people. We haven't used this in a speech recently, but I remember talking to, to two African Americans in Philadelphia who are heavily involved in the ACORN organization, which is the organization that managed to redirect $8 billion worth of bank lending to the inner city. And um, they used to be heavy TV watchers. And as they slowly grew in all of this, they wound up saying, we don't have time for TV anymore. We're having a lot more fun. And they actually compared what they're doing in terms of fun to watching TV and to the usual sort of American pastime. And they wound up saying, hey, their lives are much, much better these days. And so are the lives of their children. But let's, let's go over here. Yeah. Can, can you all hear her? But um, media, I think things. Oh boy. Well, I think things <laughs> evolve. Uh, it, uh, a society and people need a change, and this is this is not a long way from a living democracy. But it's interesting in the past few years how call-in talk shows really seem to be a big deal. Rush Limbaugh, uh, talk radio in the afternoon. Maybe all we're maybe all we do, all we can do right now is carpet one another. I mean, we're hardly we're a long way from. Uh, deciding, like in Cuba, what our communities are going to be. But people are starting to at least call in. It's, it's a real distancing sort of thing. But also, the institutions listen to these folks. They care for us on value. You know, uh, mm -hmm. so there is a little, little glimmer mm -hmm. of something going. You know, we have had a wonderful time in Iowa, and there's only been one bad moment, and that lasted about four or five seconds. And it was when somebody told us last night that there's a huge number of people on campus who wish to listen to Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, we thought that the Iowans were just fantastic. <laughs> Is that actually true? Is that what, yeah, look at this. Everybody's nodding. Yeah, yeah. I think it's true everywhere. Well, it's true. There are millions and millions of people listening to this guy. But you know, you're right. You're really right. But if you look over that list of, of arts of democracy in that last handout, what you see there is something that takes this very bare beginning of, of you know, people trying to express their views a great deal further. I mean, after all, we not only have to spout our own opinions and our own prejudices, we also have to listen. And then we have to find out how in the world we can begin to, to merge what we've listened with what we feel and what we, we, what we experience and how we can develop a common sense of direction and then finally, we have to really bring that to a point that we call public judgment and, and that we can all act upon. And that's a very different democratic process than simply shouting some prejudice at somebody. You know? but, but you're right, at least shouting is a lot better than, I suppose, I guess it's better than, 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 than keeping quiet. Um, yeah, let's, let's go up here. Right. Um, I think one of the greatest problems in society is the climate that we're living in. Before we can get to democracy, it's setting a climate where people can socialize in a healthy manner. And it seems as though you can all hear him, right? Today, okay. Um, okay. there's such a, a a sense of isolationism mm -hmm. where people, you know, ask, first of all, the distractions involved with work in and of itself or school, and then um, after that little part of your day is over, you go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have things there. You have you know, your bills, your TV, and whatnot. And we have to overcome this to uh, to, to find places where we can mm -hmm. convene, and, mm -hmm. and where it's all inclusive. It's not mm -hmm. just a special mm -hmm. interest group. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with the, with the whole structure of the city, you getting in your car, isolating mm -hmm. yourself, going to your little place, and not having those community little corner stores where you'll go to mm -hmm. and run into people like the inner city mm -hmm. or 
maybe places in Cuba were. Mm -hmm. Do you want to react to that? Well, uh, did everybody hear the, the gist of what he was saying, our isolation? Yeah. And, and again, back to the lessons that we're learning by, by listening, is that precise, the, the, the successful organizations that we're looking at start right there. They start with reconnecting people. They don't start with an issue. They start, start with a campaign. They start with house meetings where people are reconnecting and listening to each other's concerns. In fact, in Memphis, um, probably it's been a very long time, probably decades before, the, since there have been blacks and whites sitting down together in homes uh, on a regular basis. And this is how the, the very successful organization there is operating. What is it, 456 house meetings mm -hmm. involving thousands of yeah. Memphians um, ended up uh, just beginning by listening, not beginning with an issue or a campaign, just listening. Uh, ended up creating an agenda for the city that involved uh, very important school reform that then, because the relationships had been established, there were enough volunteers to put together 110 teams of people, black and white, to go in and interview staff and students and, and auxiliary staff and all the public schools <coughs> in Memphis and then to develop out of that a, a very uh, sophisticated plan for reform that the parents and others could get behind. In other words, but my real point is going back to your observation, that it started with relationship building because that's what's missing in our isolated, uh, our isolated lives. And in this case, it began primarily through organizations coming through the, the churches because certainly in some cities, the, the churches are still the, 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 the churches, synagogues are still the, the most important uh, social grouping where people have at least some sense of at least <laughs> recognizing each other when they walk through the, the doorway Sunday or Saturday. And uh, they began there and then worked from there. So I think your observation is right and that's really why the successes have to start with the reconnecting each other. And I want to throw out a hypothesis and it's really only an hypothesis but connecting the comments of, of, of the last two people who spoke from, from the audience. You know, learning, evaluating, as Patrick was pointing out a little while ago. Just start doing it about any issue that interests you, about any subject that interests you. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to see the um, university structured differently. They, they've got to hear you back there. Okay. I'd like to see the university structured differently because the example you gave last night of the sixth grade class that, that decided EPA wasn't going to do their job and they were going to do it. And what they learned from that process and the multifaceted aspects of that, that that's the teaching process. That's, that's real education. But the university doesn't teach like that. The university teaches narrow little curriculum. People don't really address real problems in any kind of comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. What they do instead are ask to write a paper that may or may not have <laughs> any real relationship to real life or what they care about or what they're going to be doing when they get there. Mm -hmm. A number of people have to leave right now and know, and you should feel free to do that. Obviously, you do feel free to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Yeah, really. Um, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation with those, those who want to stay. Okay. And I, I'd like people to respond to what Joe was just saying, but I know it's been hard for, for some people to listen, but I, I know this is exactly the moment where you have to go. And it has nothing to do with you, Joe. <laughs> That's to the point he's making now. <laughs> it's an illustration. <laughs> Actually, we waited for Joe. We waited to call on Joe until exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> no, but it's it is. It's an illustration. <laughs> why, why don't we just? I mean, we have enough people. Why don't we just sort of face each other? You want to do that for a moment? That's right. <laughs> That's radical too. You want to just face each other radically? Why don't we do that? I think that would have been a good start. I think that's an important thing next to us. Do a circle. I know. I know. I think that would have been great. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we just say for another, you know, five or ten minutes or something like that, just to barely get the get a sense of what's going on? Yeah. 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 How people were reacting to what Joe was saying about the universe. Did all of you hear what? Okay, Joe, you, you, you want to summarize this thing? Uh, because some, some of these folks didn't quite get the example of this last night. Class, sixth grade class decided that that something about to be done. They don't know how to do it, but they they convinced themselves in very short order that, that we can do that. And they can do that.
Right. They came and on Saturday, so they, they raised the money. It was so they also learned what they yeah. need to know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, educating or learning them by doing, which is really what we're talking about, right. the democracy process, is what we don't do in the university. Right. Really. I mean, right. I don't see it. Well, okay. That's no, I'm not Well, we don't. That's right. Right. our educational system don't work that right. way. Do all of you agree with that? Although I think there's a trend in, in yeah. public education now. I just attended a, a presentation by a group of teachers in one of the schools. And there's this trend to have cooperative learning as part of, at the elementary level mm -hmm. of education. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. It's not just, again, the elementary level, apparently. It's like the bottom three grades. And there was a fourth grade teacher who went to this conference, and everybody was all excited that a fourth grade teacher was there because it was like, well, cooperative learning again <laughs> <laughs> in the third grade. Oh my God, this is revolutionary. Uh -huh. um, and but they pointed out that our educational system has been has emphasized individual learning and competitiveness, and then there's been this sort of cooperation. And now and then you send a couple of kids off together to do something, and they're trying to emphasize, not just emphasize. But I think they're trying to focus the curriculum on uh, cooperative learning. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the impression I have, and I would assume that the goal would be someday to institute this, implement this at all levels of mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. university level as, as well. Mm -hmm. But how, how it will actually happen, who knows? I mean, they're talking about retraining elementary teachers mm -hmm. at you know, kindergarten one, two, and three. Um, the fourth grade teacher goes, that's, well, you know, he, he, she or he is sort of out of place until the system accepts that this is also appropriate at fourth, mm -hmm. fifth, and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a fad? Is that just one? I hope not. Well, my, my mom is an elementary school teacher, and I know that cooperative learning is the in thing now as far as, as, far as yeah. training um, elementary school teachers. And because I also remember when I was in high school, I don't I don't remember the exact you know title of what the training was, but all of my high school teachers at that point were going through a new type of school training. I mean, this is something that, and I've always wondered, you know, um, cooperative learning is a wonderful idea, but who's to say that? You know, these ideas are the best because they're retraining in something new every three, four years. And um, I know cooperative learning is, is really, it's not very, it's hard to do. It's real complicated. It's so integrated into the system. And um, as far as from what I know, all it is is working in group activities together and solving the problems as a group. And then they, <coughs> they go back to their individual seats for instruction. It's a, it's a tough thing to actually apply to real life. The students know that at one point in their, co their classroom activities they're going to get together in groups, but otherwise they will um, either wander back in real quick or just get repeating it. So it's kind of a that, tough thing. That's a little bit away from what, what I'm trying to say. Um, systems don't work in a vacuum and things are all connected together. But botanist is looked at and you train somebody just to be a botanist, then that's the way they look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that but that often doesn't seem to solve the problem. Right. You know? mm -hmm. Problems don't work like that. Problems, you know, right. like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but we don't teach like this. We teach like this. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, You're saying we need to be more diverse. Mm -hmm. Well no, we need to do it differently. Mm -hmm. It's not just well diversity is part of it, but it's it's a it's not a we we don't think of it as a whole. Well, it's enough to enable us to understand other other uh, philosophies. Mm -hmm. okay. Enough enough for that. Is that well, no, I, I think maybe I'm way off. But well, I think story my of complaint or my my idea is that we should teach in a whole. Mm -hmm. See, that's what we don't do. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's an issue of whether we're going to teach whether we're teaching or become a uh, productive member of society as an electronic unit, or whether we're teaching to be human beings. I have teachers in, in school right now, and so oftentimes I realize that they're often completely on this mode of, um, you know, like you say, very competitive. Um, will I will I get my assignments done? Will I know exactly what the teacher wants me to know? Instead of the being creative, expressive, you know, behaviors that you'd like to see in mm -hmm. anybody, not mm -hmm. just children but adults as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, you deserve to be treated the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's. Um, I think that we've trained towards becoming this economic unit. That, that drives our society and that drives our industrial society. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one of the interesting um, 
and you know, hopeful to us, and it may be an ironic change, is that is that I agree. I think you know we would agree that you've described the exactly the way that that we all experienced growing up to be taught to fit in economic units. But I think there's a broad sense, even among many industrial leaders today, that that doesn't work. And so it doesn't work nearly as well as it's got to. We're, we're not really functioning well. And, 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 and so there's this broader understanding of our of self-interest being changed towards what one of the more hopeful things in addition to cooperative learning that we're, we've been observing is a, is a shift toward, in some schools, certainly not generalized yet or not broadly, a theme, but but a sort of theme teaching where a whole class. Remember that that school uh, that we just talked to the principal in Boulder, uh, an elementary school where the teachers got together a, and then decided on a theme for the entire class for the whole semester. There was a question they were pursuing, and that integrated the knowledge that. And we we've, we've um, seen that model working um, in, in in a number of schools around the the country. One of the the ones that now has become a prime example that people travel all over the country to, to observe is in uh, Harlem, East Harlem, Central Park East Secondary School, where everything is, is um, organized around themes. And so our hope is that sort of this combination of the kind of dissatisfaction that you all are expressing, combined with the sense that, that those who used to benefit from this narrow sort of teaching aren't benefiting in a way that they want to, that there will be a a more and more interest in, in pursuing some of these different approaches. See, I don't know whether cooperative learning is going to turn out to be a fad. I don't even care that much. And the reason I don't care is that there are lots and lots of phrases, and lots of different approaches that, you know, pick up a piece of this very large picture. But what I do know is that the kind of trend that Francis was just talking about really is occurring across all of these sectors. It's occurring in, in corporations that are finding out that people can, in fact, collaborate a great deal better and that the kind of system top-down and all of that authoritarian system doesn't really work nearly as well as they thought. Um, and it's occurring in the media where newspapers are learning that, in fact, if they're going to increase their readership or if they're going to hold on to the readers they've got and, and some of the, and, and, you know, that, that, in fact, they've got to start listening to people more. And we see this explosion in radio and TV of, of two-way and interactive kinds of, of, of media. And, and, and you know, as I said, you know, corporations, and of course we can talk about it in schools. The key here, I think, is that once we let the genie out of the bottle, the genie being, you know, that, that you can't put it back in. And the genie has something to do with people discovering that all of us can have fun in growth and in collaboration and in these kinds, and in learning these sorts of skills, and that we can wind up with a better community or a better country because of the kinds of activities that we can become engaged in. And so the genie of engagement, whether you want to call it at, in second grade cooperative learning, you know, um, or you want to call it one of literally 20 or 30 other things, doesn't really matter. What does matter is that, in fact, almost everywhere, people are beginning to discover that I've got just as much going for me as these so-called leaders, and that it's fun and rewarding for me to be involved. And that, that's a whole other kind of story than, you know, than what, what we've usually yeah. been taught. It's, it's sort of once the, the assumptions start shifting, then there's no turning back. And we need to and it, you know, it, it happens at the college <laughs> level, okay? I mean, there are colleges in which all, small colleges, in which all students come together on Wednesday morning to discuss anything about the college that anybody wants to bring up, from the budget to who the next president is going to be. Okay, I mean, there are places where, where that happens. Once you've had that education, try going to Iowa State or any place else, right. you know, and, and not talking about well, it or whatever. You know, we, we visited a public school, public school in upstate New York, where students come together like this every week and make policy for the entire school. Now, this was a renegade French, uh, friends school. Of, of 20 years ago. Today, that principal is sought after by everybody as an advisor on school reform. But why? Because the school's working and everybody wants to go there now. So, I mean, again, it's the genie out of the bottle. Um, in fact, it, it was the same school, these children last year voted to increase their own high school graduation requirement. Uh, so, you know, other people look at this school and they say, how are they, how are they doing this? And they're doing it because the, the, the kids themselves 
feel it's their school. We have this wonderful quote in, in our book about, you know, this is our school. We make things happen here. So, of course, we're going to be more active throughout our whole lives because we, we know that we can do it here. Okay. You talked about uh, doing things personally and uh, in small groups. And uh, I wonder how, how, uh, how effective that's going to be in, uh, in the broader terms of the government and how we have to affect the government and how fast we have to affect the government to be more accountable to the things they do. Um, I know coming together as groups, we're going to do that eventually. But how long is that going to take for everyone to get this message and then to... Um, a long time. Right, exactly. <laughs> and you know, the government's uh, doing all this for society or you know, it affects every aspect of our life. You know, there's always something about the government that all of us don't like, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be economics or, or uh, health care <coughs> or whatever. But I just wonder how long it can go on before we really focus on the big thing. Um, I wonder what directions we can do to affect the big thing and, and making the government more, more accountable to the things they do and not, not I, I have three comments, but if you want to finish up. Okay, very briefly, I, I just have three very quick comments. One of the dangers about focusing on government, and the reason we try not to do it in these talks, is that as soon as people start talking about democracy, mm -hmm. they immediately start thinking about government. And what we're saying is that democracy relates to government, media, human services, your hospital, your streets, your anything, your schools, your whatever, and that it's all aspects of your life, essentially. Um, so we always have to, I, I always get just slightly tense when somebody brings up the subject of government because because I want to be sure that, that you know we make that distinction that, that we're not talking about government. On the other hand, we oh, have to include yeah. government. Second thing I want to say is that um, there's a book out by Ted Gaylor and who else? I think it's called Reinventing Government, mm -hmm. and it's becoming very very popular. Osborne and, and yeah, okay, and it's called Reinventing Government. It's becoming very very popular among public officials and public administrators across the country. And it talks in a variety of ways about the fact that, in fact, government is learning a number of lessons. The governments all across the country, literally thousands of them, are learning a number of lessons. And so this very slow revolution that we've been talking about in schools is happening in government also. Um, and the third thing that I want to say is that our own book and some of the examples on that first handout um, um, mention um, governments, local governments, that are redefining their relationship to citizens. And citizens redefining their relationship to government. And there are various ways to do that so that we're not stuck in a very narrow model of simple representative government. I mean, what does it mean when you have simply a city council that makes all the decisions for a given city? Thank you for coming. Thank you for um, coming. Um, okay, that's one kind of government. But then there are governments that have left that intact but then have established neighborhood councils in which lots and lots of decision making and lots of coming to public judgment takes place and those are transmitted to, to government and in some cases, as in St. Paul for example, that kind of system has been in place now for 20 years and it changes the public culture entirely so that mayors and city council people know damn well that they don't come close to making important decisions until in fact lots and lots of people at the council, at the small neighborhood level, have, have had a major role in coming to terms with all of that. And as they point out in reinventing government and quite a number of other places, it may mean that the governmental process takes longer, but it also means that it is qualitatively, dramatically better. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that that book, Reinventing Government, you can order from our institute if you're interested. <laughs> and or, uh, yeah. Um, and the other thing I we should have from your own bookstore probably. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that um, a lot of the things we've been saying today are summarized in a little booklet that we produced called Living Democracy, which is a is a sort of condensed version of the first part of our book. And so if you want to take any of these ideas into your classes or into your organizations, there's this little booklet that you could also order from our organization. But that that relates to something that somebody um, had had to leave. Um, that earlier again, there's just so little material. So what we've decided is that the next several decades of our lives is about gathering material and distributing material and producing material on our own 
that begins to chart some of this kind of change that we're talking about in every sector. Yeah. yeah. Well, Experts ought to be on tap, not on top. Um, why don't you explain this? Go ahead. Well, um, I think that that uh, there's no, there's nothing in the philosophy or the, the perspective that we're putting forth that in any way undercuts the need for expertise. We need more expertise, um, but that it's a question of how is that expertise used <coughs> and how it is. In other words, that the role of, of us as a, a, a citizen uh, is to set the, the value uh, ground within which then the expertise get a, gets applied. Last night, uh, um, we used the example of Oregon, or go, uh, people in Oregon coming together to decide how was the best way to use a limited number of public health dollars. And so the, the people in this interactive process, hundreds of people, thousands of people in hundreds of house meetings, um, they, they grappled with the values, which, how do we make decisions, these kind of life and death decisions? And of course, to do that, they had to have me medical expertise coming in to tell them about what are the implications of their different choices. There's a tremendous amount of, of expertise that had to be applied, but the citizens had to discuss the values. What do we care about? Um, and they had to make some tough choices that weren't medical choices, they were values. Is it more important to keep a baby alive born without a brain for two weeks? Or is it more important to have, you know, so many thousands of women covered in prenatal care? Those are value questions. They're not medical questions. So I don't think anything that we're saying undercuts the need for experts. Uh, in fact we need we need, you know, obviously our quality is saying we we need all kinds of expertise. And Well, yeah. but see, it's by saying we had Oprah's audience there, what we're saying is that more perspectives have to come in. And that's what we're talking about. And yes, they need information. Right. But what was so moving to us about the Oregon experience is how much common ground, when you get enough people talking and reflecting together, there wasn't a lot of dissent. There weren't, you know, demonstrations, I'm for keeping a baby alive at all costs, and I'm for, you know, prenatal care. At, people did learn to reason together and to learn to make tough choices. And we've, we've seen this, um, uh, so many instances uh, that, that human beings are capable in, if the environment, and that's where the art of democracy comes from. How do we create the environment in which people feel that they are listened to and therefore they're able, maybe for the first time, to listen to, to others? Um, yeah, let's talk about that environment for a minute. If you had Oprah's audience sitting in front of a panel of five women, each of which had given birth to a baby with no brain, you'd wind up with one kind of decision from that audience. But if you didn't have Oprah's audience, but in or you had Oprah's audience, but in fact it wasn't just a panel of those people, but it was all the other people with claims on the health care system, <coughs> and it wasn't limited to a one-hour show, and it wasn't about a show, and it wasn't about drama, but was in fact about us learning about the needs of all the people in our community, 
beginning to balance mm -hmm. that out and having to come up with a budget eventually that has priorities about where the health care dollar is going to go. It wouldn't be anything that would appeal to Oprah Winfrey, but it would in fact be something about public judgment that could express the values of the entire community. And I dare say that there are people who in fact may have babies born without brains who may begin to understand some of the needs that other people could also put on the table. I remember that story from El Paso where the, uh, uh, this, it was televised there, but it wasn't an Oprah and Winfrey kind of format. Televised what they call issue form, where they remember the story about how they brought together elderly people who thought that their health needs were not being adequately addressed in El Paso, and they had their agenda. But they were in this issue form process listening then to their Hispanics who had whose health care was so much worse than anything that the, the elderly had to face, that they reassessed their own needs in light of what they were hearing from other people in the community. Um, we were very moved by that. Yeah, and they wound up saying, look, our needs are important, and we want to see how much of that we can get met, but we also recognize the legitimacy of these other needs, and in fact, they were willing to say that some of these other needs are even more, have more immediate pressing demand on the dollars available. And they could do that once they could begin to enter into relationship and could begin to to listen a great deal more than we ever can, you know, on the you know, Oprah kind of format or any other format that's usually available. And where are the public forums these days in which Americans can face each other and begin to sort this out? Well Charles, in the moment here uh struggling with the problem of trying to make And I don't know what's the best thing to do. I know this is a personal question I'm asking you, but um, I see the community process not working. And I don't know where to try to, I don't know how to begin to try to make it work again. Because I know that it doesn't work. It's uh, controlled by people who have other interests and not the interests of the community. And most people in town know that. But most, but the, uh, for example, the Paper is owned by, literally, physically owned by developers, and uh, and people assume that fighting City Hall is a, is a waste of time, and it proved to be over the last year, for example, I think. Uh, and but my first tendency is to try to get a, a big enough organization or a mean enough organization to take over and do the same things that anybody's done to us. Okay, that's a the model of, of finding some way to make it into a real community is something that's really what I want to participate in, but I don't quite know how to begin, really. Uh, one, of the, one of the lessons, <laughs> again, I'm repeating this term, um, that in an observation, well, I'll start with observation, that so many people are lamenting the, the downfall of what many have called mediating institutions. The, the, the clubs and, and religious organizations that brought people out of their homes, out of the isolation, um, and that those are now in decline. So a first, a first step for many people who ask the question you're asking is what are the remaining mediating institutions and how do we build on those? Uh, what are, uh, certainly there are religious organizations, there are civic organizations. How do we start with what we have and to change change the way they operate, and particularly the religious community is what we've been investigating most recently, for example, in Nashville, <coughs> where there's, a, there's an organizing effort underway there which has the most, the motif is using the, the congregation as the starting point. And when within each congregation now, about 40 in that city, uh, having meetings uh, where a certain number of congregants agree to hold house meetings in their homes where they just listen to the concerns of other people. And it just begins again, not with an issue, but begins with relationship building. And then there's a network of religious organizations. And now they also, they're including the public housing project in this, in this house meeting process, and perhaps the local union. But, but beginning not with, okay, I'm going to go out and, and reform AIMS with my agenda, but I'm going to help initiate this. this is a, it's a long term, this is taking two, this is not an overnight, you know taking two years in Nashville to get to the point to begin the house meeting. But um, well, my, my that's one that, process. Is that 
but my narrow perspective, because I don't know everything, you know, I mean, there are a lot of good things, good relationships in the community that I'm not aware of, I'm sure, but my narrow perspective is the political process failed, you know, failed, failed, failed. So what do we do instead? And what I hear you saying is go out in the community and find the places where relationships do exist and find ways to build on them. I was going to mention Pat Mayberry Council. I, I was just going to go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the same thing. Go last ahead. week we were in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the same trip to, to Nashville, and there uh, it's a very different process there, but something worth looking at, you know, for inspiration. But um, in 1986 they put together a 1984 four. four. They put together what they called Vision 2000. You have probably heard about this sort of process in a number of communities where they. In this case, they 1,700 people participated again in sort of house tight meetings in a in a process of first putting up, you know, what are our priorities for improving Chattanooga, and then narrowing that down. And put and, and um, out of that process came in, uh, about oh hundreds of goals, of which eight years later about 85 percent have been met. I mean, there's some very special characteristics about Chattanooga that made this possible. But but the process again of an open wide open, cross-race, cross-class process, but very visible. So that, you know, many people in Chattanooga would have said that this newspaper is bought off by the, by the wealthy interest in this town, this is a run by the Old Boys Network, and yet, because it was a totally open process, uh, and they went to such lengths to engage different sections of the community, uh, that it did have some very real impact including you know a battered women's everything from a battered women's shelter to a new state uh, aquarium to the, the became the centerpiece of the a new revitalized downtown uh, so that's something you might want to read there are a number of cities that have gone through this process um, uh, Roanoke uh, Phoenix uh, that of a, of a citywide sort of real public visioning process that might be interesting to look Because we're talking realistically. Yeah. We don't want to minimize the difficulty, and as Francis mentioned, how long it can take. It can also be very, very difficult. And there are drawbacks to every single bit of this. If you're doing congregation-based organizing, for example, because that's the last institution left in your state, you also know that there are going to be a number of people who are not going to participate precisely because it is congregation-based. And you know that because it is congregation-based, there are also some limits as to how far they will go. You know how much, you know how much time and effort you have to pour into just getting some minister or some rabbi to go along with you and to permit this kind of thing to be happening and so on. Um, so it's it's you know there there are limitations in Chattanooga. Um, they had this wonderful process, and the reason I was thinking about Chattanooga a minute ago, and I'll tie this in in just a second, um, um, is, is related to, to the earlier point about, about experts, but um, they had this wonderful process, this citywide process, and yet the fact is that some of the poorest and some of the darkest of all the citizens of Chattanooga really didn't participate in the last round, but they expect to participate eight years later in the round. <coughs> I literally have just begun this, this past week. Um, um, and their environmental concerns and the toxic dumping in their poor community <coughs> did not address the first time around. Um, there are limitations. There are always going to be criticisms that are going to be valid. And yet, in fact, the process moves forward. And most of the people of these communities feel that they're better off. Okay. Uh, you, you were about to. Well, it's just that what Paul's describing in, in these. In, in, it be, even even if you can say that the immediate gains are, are limited or difficult to achieve, but, but you begin, by, even by going through this process, to legitimize the notion that citizens have a lot more to say about this community than simply voting to elect a, a given you know, official every few years. And that starts again back to the genie out of the bottle that, that, that Paul was saying to Jennifer's <coughs> comment, that once those assumptions start shifting about what citizens' roles should be, how can you, you know, go back to a process in which citizens aren't consulted, uh, so that it begins to open up? Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that I wanted to relate um, the question about Chattanooga to, uh, uh, the point about Chattanooga to, to the question about, about experts um, was that 
Chattanooga and came together, as Francis said, in this Vision 2000 kind of process. And now they're talking about Revision 2000, and that's the process they're in right now, in which they established all of these goals throughout the city in these, in these meetings, and thousands of people um, contributed to that. And anybody who had anything to say was considered legitimate, and those goals went up on this large sheet, and then they began to kind of boil those down. And they discovered that there were three parts of the city that they wanted to focus on. One of them was the downtown area where they wanted a good deal more physical development. They wanted a bridge restored, and they wanted a new um, aquarium, and they wanted this and that, and a riverfront park, and so on. That, then, is where the experts came in. That once the values had been established, the framework, the priorities had been listed, then the experts could come in and could begin to come up with some of the options as to how that might might happen. That's something like an architect we know, who's a very, very good architect, who says, I can't design your house for you until you tell me what he calls your program. Once I know what you're really going to do, what you really value, large kitchens and small bathrooms, or vice versa, or whatever it is, or where you want to play and where you want to study, or whatever it is, then I can begin. But I've got to know your values first. That's exactly what we found in the fight organization almost well, more than two decades ago, when we took poor people who had never been involved in, in any decision, public decision-making process to think of and said, all right, look, we now have gotten a major federal grant to build low-income housing, and you're going to have, since we're taking your land, you're going to have first call on the units. What do you want these units to contain? And in meeting after meeting, they began to discuss all sorts of things, and it turned out that things that the architects who had originally drawn up some ideas had never thought of turned out to be very, very important. They didn't want a central laundry facility. They wanted a, a washer, these people with large families. Obviously, it sounds obvious now, but they wanted a washer and dryer in every single apartment. And they didn't give a damn if they had to give up some carpeting in some room in order to get the washer and dryer. They were willing to make the trade off. But the point is that the experts came in later, that they had been held on tap, they were not on top, they were not making the decisions, and the most important final decisions, they were being drawn on. Um, and in fact, as Francis said too, what we really needed in the process were even better experts than we had. We, we need to wrap this up fairly soon, but go ahead. Well, go ahead. you can say that this goes now with the international development, of course, mm -hmm. and that too. This is big news, I mean, this finally is at the end of it, this is big news that maybe we need to go into a village. We should ask them to <laughs> <laughs> what they want for the big town and make a part of it. There's a radical <laughs> idea. <laughs> Thank all of you very, very, very much. Thank you very, very much.